very happy to see so many faces, also I think from other uh, parts of the Institute. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is uh, Alberto Acerbi. Alberto is an anthropologist by training, uh, but his major work, I would say, is in the realm of cultural evolution, which of course is very interdisciplinary, so maybe that's what brought everyone here together. Uh, and currently he is a lecturer at Brunel University, uh, at the Center for Cultural, Culture and Evolution, very fittingly. And uh, in his work, he's uh, particularly using agent-based modeling, but also looking at large-scale cultural data. Uh, and one of his uh, sort of key interests uh, is looking at cultural evolutionary mechanisms and trends, I would say. And uh, I know lately he's also been interested in misinformation and fake news, uh, particularly, which uh, I think we will also be hearing about today a bit. And I think uh, one other particularly noteworthy part is that he's also written a book, which is not coincidentally called Cultural Evolution in the Digital Age, which I very much can recommend um, checking out and reading. It's a really great book. Um, and there's also, um, I saw lately, uh, been a uh, sort of online guide for agent-based modeling in cultural evolution, which also for anyone who is interested in going into that, might want to check out that resource as well. Yeah, but without further ado, I'm very happy uh, to give the floor to you. Thank you very much. That was a very fancy introduction, so I'm not very used to this, but thank you. And thank you for inviting me here. It has been a quite... Uh... Actually, one more thing. Uh, do you want questions at the end or during the talk? Uh, as you prefer. I don't mind. I don't know what is the, the, the normal... Uh, okay. I think we can have a raise of hands. And... Okay, yeah. let's, let's do like this. So, um, awesome. Yeah, so I would say thank you for inviting me. It has been so far an intense day, as I was saying. It will be probably keep on being intense, but uh, it's good. And uh, I, I will will give you a quick uh, introduction about myself. So as, as Thomas was uh, was saying, I'm an anthropologist. I, I do research in the field of cultural evolution. I will not say too much about the cultural evolution in general during this talk, but. Uh, uh, the values, uh, search, and uh, things that I will present are basically, uh, as you will see, uh, there are various ideas and methods from, from cultural evolution. And uh, a few years ago, around uh, 2015, I started to think about applying uh, these ideas and tools from cultural evolution to uh, what was happening, what is happening with the diffusion of uh, digital and online media. At the moment, uh, the, the idea was that, I mean, of course, there was work on uh, information spread on digital media, which is what I'm most interested. But at the moment, at least my impression was that uh, this work was good, so it was very computationally sophisticated, but I had the impression that sometimes was lacking some like a, a robust theory about human behavior, about social interaction. So, uh, the, the ambition was a bit to say, okay, maybe cultural evolution could uh, provide this theory. Uh, as we discussed this morning, I, I don't think that cultural evolution is a uh, theory, <laughs> is a, is a well-formed theory, but I think it's a set of uh, uh, concepts, ideas that uh, works kind of well together, and I will present you some of these, of these concepts today. And um, so, yeah, today I want to talk about uh, uh, three things uh, which are quite related. Uh, the first two, as Thomas was saying, is about my research on social influence online and misinformation uh, in this cultural evolutionary perspective. And in the end, I'm talking uh, to some more work in progress about cumulative culture in uh, digital online media. I will tell you later what cumulative culture is. So let's start with the uh, uh, the first one. So obviously, you know uh, that in the last year, uh, there has been a big uh, diffusion of the narrative of, uh, of uh, the danger of social influence online, so uh, fake news and uh, political propaganda and misinformation. Um, when I started, actually, in 2015, this was not there yet. Was, before Brexit, before Trump, so people were kind of uh, neutral about that. It started after, and uh, I, I kind of been always skeptical about this, this narrative. 
and uh, I will explain to you why. And one thing I think is that uh, if we have a cultural revolutionary perspective, uh, the idea of uh, social influences will be different. So this is one, one, the first of the ideas coming from cultural revolution I will present today. So uh, a very, like one of the most central idea in cultural revolution is the idea of uh, social learning strategies. Is the idea that uh, uh, social learning needs to be uh, strategic. This is really like one basis. So the, the idea of an evolutionary approach to culture is that uh, if social learning uh, uh, exists, uh, if it's uh, relatively stable, it should be on average adaptive for, uh, for individuals. Of course, it's not error free, but the, the idea is that uh, there are various heuristics that are used by, uh, by us to decide when to copy, what to copy, from who to copy. So we are not like, uh, how can I say, passive receiver of social information, but we are active seeker of social information. We, we, we decide uh, when to be influenced. So this is a kind of a first uh, boundary to an idea of generalized uh, social influence. And I think it's something that, uh, that we are trying to do now, I think is quite interesting to, to apply this uh, idea of social learning strategies to the uh, spread of information online. So instead of having a generalized notion of social influence, we try to understand what kind of strategy people use when they decide whether to say or retweet something. And this is what we are doing in, uh, this is a work mostly made by, by Mason and Blood. So we are trying to use this idea of social learning strategies to understand the uh, uh, spread of tweets supporting the uh, voter fraud in 2020 US election. So if you remember, uh, some Trump supporters say that the election was rigged and this idea spread uh, also in Twitter. So I, I just wanted to mention this work because I think it's, it's an interesting for future development. So what we can do here is to do a, a, an individual based model. So we have simulation and uh, in the individual based model, we can implement different assumptions about the social learning strategies that individuals use. So, like for example, uh, conformity bias, they copy popular uh, tweet, novelty bias, they retweet preferentially uh, novel tweet, content bias, and so on. So we produce different output in the model according to the strategy we implement, and then we can compare it with the real data. So, like, like here, you know, if you can see the the, the black line is the uh, empirical distribution of the tweet that we observe. And then the things are a bit more complicated, but the idea is that we can see which one of our output of the model is more similar to this empirical distribution. And so we say, okay, this gives some support that the strategy used by the individuals was uh, that one. And in this case, the, the strategy seemed to be uh, a content bias. So, uh, again, not generalized social influence, but people were deciding to retweet uh, tweet with a specific content. Uh, long story short, this was tweet with more negative content. It's something that I will uh, repeat again after about the, the importance of negative content. So tweet uh, about the uh, voter fraud that were negative were uh, preferentially retweeted. So this is the first aspect, social learning strategies give a bit more content to the idea of social influence. I think one can go even a uh, step beyond this. So one, one other aspect that uh, for me was interesting in the last year is that uh, uh, when we look at experiments in cultural evolution, but also in other disciplines about social learning, uh, we can see that we tend to discount social information. So. The problem seems to be not that we are too much influenceable, but that we are not uh, changing enough when we find some uh, optimal information. So it's, it's even more than what the cultural revolution people will say. I will just give you some uh, quote of various experiments. So uh, once again, these results suggest that players do not consistently use the social information provided in this treatment in any way captured by our models. And, and this is interesting because these are cultural evolution people that were hoping to find the, the optimal uh, usage. And so it's, it's not the result that they wanted. So they are like kind of complaining that the participants were not doing the, the right thing. 
uh, a considerable number of participants did not use social information. By the end of an experimental farm, only about 20%. Biden is for acquiring information individually rather than socially. This is my favorite. I don't know if you know Alex Mesuti, but he's complaining in the title. Basically, pay of buying social learning is adaptive but underused. And uh, anyway, we then did, uh, did uh, a proper review of this literature with Olivier Morel and, and other. And we, we found that this phenomenon seems quite robust. In our, in our sample, um, and the use of social information was 10 times more common than the correct or the overuse. So, in our sample, for each experiment in which participants were using correctly or overusing uh, social, social information, there were 10 experiments in which participants were not using it enough. And um, so, when you look at this, uh, um, I think uh, uh, it goes a bit beyond the uh, uh, traditional cultural evolution uh, explanation. Another approach of uh, about social uh, social learning, evolutionary approach of social learning, is called uh, epistemic vigilance. I always advise this book from uh, Hugo Mercier, which is also an evolutionary approach, but is a, a bit more different, considered more sophisticated cognitive mechanism. And interesting, the idea of these approaches that the default state for us is to not accept new information. So the problem is not that we are too gullible, the problem is that we are too stubborn. And if you look at the, uh, all the scale about fake news and misinformation, it, it seems to us that this is exactly the opposite problem. And uh, this is a kind of uh, review or something like a, theoretical patient, I know that we did with uh, Sasha Altieri and Manon Berish, in which uh, we are looking from this, perpe this perspective to the uh, widespread claim about the fact that misinformation is abundant in social media, misinformation has an advantage with respect to information, misinformation is likely to change belief and behaviors, and we think that uh, um, Basically, none of this claim is really supported by empirical data, and we think that it's not supported for good reason, because, because uh, the, there is a, a good explanation about why uh, a social influence doesn't work in this way. And uh, so what's the, the way out for me is, for me is that uh, there has been uh, too much focus on misinformation, uh, which has not been, in my opinion, uh, particularly productive. And we think it would be more interesting to uh, have a broader uh, approach to uh, information, uh, information circulation in online and social media and not focusing necessarily on misinformation. I just want to show you this a, a bit. Uh, um, this is a little model, individual based model that we did to try to, to claim that uh, uh, it's much more important to focus on uh, true information than to uh, fake news. So, if, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as we say, the amount of uh, uh, fake news in, in social media is low, and all the, all the uh, estimates give uh, uh, like things like 5% percentage of information is fake. Sometimes you have in Facebook 10, 14, but then you will see after that I think that these, these uh, estimates are not really good. But anyway, it's always a minority, and the majority is, is uh, reliable information. If we can do something to increase the acceptance of reliable information, this will have a, a larger effect than if we do something to decrease uh, the, the the acceptance of fake news. And we did this, it's a very simple model, but the idea here is that uh, if you do like strong intervention of on misinformation, you of course increase the, the uh, we call this global information score of a system. So how much truth is, is around, but you, you do much more if you do small improvement in the acceptance of true information. So what, what we would like to do is to work more in this direction that keep on uh, insisting on uh, misinformation. So to, just, to, yeah. just a question, I was thinking about like the dynamics of this, there's both the like 
propagation of the information and then private acceptance. And I guess one of the things that characterizes a lot of misinformation is this novelty. And so people like to pass it along, but we don't necessarily have as readily available a measure of private acceptance of a lot of yeah. information. So you might think that, I, I guess, that by increasing, so, so when you're increasing acceptance of the true information, is that also increasing propagation? I mean, I guess part of it is that some of the true information is like not very exciting, so I accept it, but then I'll propagate it, right? Yeah, the, the, the model is really simple. We, we, we are just uh, uh, conflating acceptance, and we, we were just making the point that given the unbalance, uh, and we are assuming, like doing a strong simplification for which uh, the, 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 the cost of uh, increasing acceptance of true information is equal to the cost of decreasing of the same degree acceptance spread of, of uh, misinformation. So we are not distinguishing this, but I think you're making a good point. So it's not uh, misinformation or not, but that things like novelty uh, is like more generally feature of the content. That's, that's when we say, okay, maybe instead of one could try to make uh, a reliable information more novel, it's, it's say like it's a bit weird, but so working on the other side of the of the problem, I don't know if this is clear. But in the model, there, there's nothing like that. It's just a, a simple thing to 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 make the point of the imbalance of quantity between the between the two. Any other question? Well, I mean, uh, this is sort of an interesting thought about whether it is easier to. Cause people to not share. Whether it's easier to cause them to share. More. Yeah. It's. It, I mean, it, obviously, we don't know, media companies have spent a lot of time trying to remove as much shrimp friction to sharing as possible, and then now are maybe adding a little bit back in. But yeah. Yeah. What I would say is, what what the model would say that if the the, the costs are more or less equal. Would be better according to us and according to the model to work on having people sharing more true information that working on people to share less uh, fake news. That 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 would be the the basic idea. Yeah. Um, well, what was that? That's a problem of the question. <laughs> and then I have to go back to that. Uh, yes, so, so, so this is a short summary of this bit about uh, social influence and information. So, uh, first thing, uh, I don't know, what's the sound? <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, first thing, uh, like, try to, to, to zoom in when we talk about social influence, not just, uh, I, I'm very, so, so there are a lot of models about simple contagion and so on. I mean, people would not use them so much, but I think one can go add a bit more of complexity. And I think this idea of social learning strategies is uh, one way to add this complexity. So when we study spread of information online, we can zoom in a bit. And uh, but then, as I was saying, in, I don't think not only not only social learning strategy, but even more, I think the problem is that we are not uh, influenceable enough that uh, we should find a way to 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 have people to uh, to respond more to to uh, correct information. And in general, so uh, the way out for me is to focus a bit less on misinformation, but try to consider more the, the uh, broad information ecosystem. And still, some misinformation exists. And when I started my my uh, search in this in this uh, kind of uh, topic, I, I was interested as many on misinformation. Um, so this is quite old. It's probably from 2018, uh, I think. But but uh, if you look, is is still now like uh, still now the same situation like. Uh, a couple of days ago, someone on Twitter was commenting like that the problem is not really misinformation. The problem is that uh, we have a, a big quantity of what you would say rubbish on, on social media, which which is not uh, necessarily misinformation. It's not uh, uh, political propaganda, very dangerous. It's just uh, uh, information that, as I will explain now, I call engaging in, in, a, in, a, in a peculiar way. And so this was the top 10 uh, fake news in Facebook, I think in 2018. But again, things are still like that. So when, when, quite often when you read the, the statistic about fake news, 
they are talking about this this kind of thing. Um, so here is another idea from from cultural evolution. Uh, not very surprising. Not all cultural traits are equal. So uh, if you think about uh, stuff like the the, the, the cross cultural success of things like masks. Uh, uh, made up faces, caricatures, portraits. Of course, there are enormous cross cultural differences. I, I'm almost an anthropologist in some time, uh, but they are basically present in different form in, in almost all societies with, with some variation. Mm -hmm. If you want to explain why that is the case, uh, I think that the, the only way is to, 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 to understand that actual faces are very uh, interesting stimuli for our, for our cognitive system. So, cultural traits that have success, uh, so, some reason of the success of cultural traits can be explained by the fact that they are more uh, attractive than other, cultural, than other cultural traits, and so this explains partly their, their uh, success. Um, so, going back to misinformation in this uh, broader sense, uh, one idea that some specific content favors uh, the cultural trait success, things like uh, negative content that I mentioned, mentioned before, uh, threat related information, disgust, and so on. So, to me, one of the features that could explain the, the limited success of misinformation, and when, when I say misinformation, you can think uh, garbage or rubbish or whatever you want to call this kind of. Uh, uh, News is that uh, because exactly by definition they are less constrained by reality, they can they can exploit better these attractive features. It doesn't need to be a conscious process. It's not that the people that wrote this kind of thing are uh, deep. Uh, maybe they are, but but uh, even if they are not, uh, given a process of cultural selection, the the, the successful uh, misinformation may have these. Uh, these features. So I did uh, a few years ago uh, a, a little study trying to, to analyze this this kind of idea. So if uh, if uh, these uh, cognitive preferences could have a, a, an influence on the success of misinformation, for example, uh, we found that uh, misinformation is uh, quite often negative. Uh, that was our prediction. So, like in our sample, like uh, negative content was five times more com common than positive content. Uh, we did this analysis for others of these uh, uh, cognitive preferences, some call them uh, factors of cultural attraction. And so, like uh, uh, one third of uh, articles was classified as threat related information. The information is often, very often, about the threat. Uh, Fifty percent, more or less, was about what we call gossip. So, the idea is that, uh, as as I try to say here, uh, the general idea is that uh, misinformation is uh, low quality information that uh, uh, spreads because uh, social media you know, are bad and do not work well and do not. Uh, give us what we want, I think, is exactly the, the opposite. I think misinformation or garbage is high quality information, which seems a bit uh, paradoxical, but it's high quality information in the sense that uh, quality is cognitive appeal. That's spread because of efficiency of online communication. Maybe we are not too happy about this, but uh, if this kind of information is popular, it's, it's just a fact. We, we may want things to be different, but we need to explain why this is popular. And one of the reasons, not, not the only reason, can be that is, uh, is manufactured in a way to, to exploit these, these cognitive preferences. And uh, a second aspect of this that uh, I, I started to uh, work a bit more uh, recently. So, besides the studies I presented, but it seems now a quite uh, uncontroversial idea that some content is more successful in social media. So, negative content, emotional content, there are many, many studies showing this kind of thing. Um, 
a question that I think is not really, really uh, studied is that, uh, is this because of social media or is it generally successful in human communication and cultural transmission? So you see the study that say, ah, negative information spreads in social media, there are like plenty of this kind of uh, titles. Okay, that, that's true, but again, is because of social media or it's just we can observe this and quantify this in social media. I think uh, to me, at least, this is an interesting question. There's not much, uh, much work on it. I think it would be important to be able to isolate uh, some features of social media versus other form of transmission and do some uh, comparison between the two and see if the same content is favored. I, I try to do something like this. The results are not super exciting, so don't, don't, but, but. The, the idea, I think, is, is okay. So, if you think about, uh, say, oral transmission, when, when, when you tell something to someone else uh, and you want to do a, a cultural transmission, so, so the, the person needs to understand what you say, needs to memorize, needs to reproduce it, is, is various things implicated. When you share something on social media, you don't need to, to, to memorize it, you don't need to reproduce you don't necessarily need to understand it. You just need to want to share it something or not. So we call two episodes of cultural transmission, but they are very different. And I think that there are many, many examples in which we just say cultural transmission, but then the things that are actually going on are, are different. And we, we, we need to, to be sure that we can put everything together. I, I try to do this, this experiment. And so again, I used the, Free of these attractive content, uh, so stories with the negative uh, content versus a neutral story, the same but without the negative content. Uh, same for disaster, same for threat-related information. And so these are uh, transmission chain experiment, which are uh, probably so, some of you will know about that. So it's, it's, it's like a laboratory version of of uh, the. the or what's the code? Is the I don't remember the English name. Anyway, that the, so you tell something to someone else, and that in a piece, and you see how the, the information change. Telephone game. Yeah. Okay, that's what it's called. The telephone game. And so, so it's a laboratory version of this, and you can check how the, the you, you see that the, the the proportion of information obviously decrease through the chain, but the the attractive content, uh, which was our prediction, is more uh, retained during the chain. The, the interesting point would be the second. So using exactly the same content, but in this case, ask people, instead of doing the uh, transmission chain, to uh, ask them if they would share or not this content online and see if there are differences. Uh, the results are not super clear, as you could see, but uh, that's when. That was the experiment. So we observed the same effect time for negative content. We saw a clear difference between uh, so these are two conditions anonymous sharing and sharing with friends. And we saw that there was uh, attractive content was uh, more shared in the negative uh, condition, but not too much for the other content. So it's uh, not super clear. One thing that I took from this and I would like to explore more in, in the future is that it seems that uh, these kind of content biases are stronger in the transmission chain experiment, in oral transmission, than in the sharing condition, which makes sense because it makes sense that these content biases would act in the uh, memorization phase in the production phase and less in the willing to share uh, uh, decision. But on the on the other side, it's quite counterintuitive because kind of imply that uh, online transmission would be less content bias than oral transmission, which I kind of think is true. But is 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 is, is probably quite uh, controversial idea yeah, because people will say oh, social media. Are the, Worst. Yeah. This seems like a really interesting point to me, this idea that, you know, in a lot of in oral transmission, you have to maybe understand things, at least in most cases. I mean, maybe you could send me and uh, have me pass on a message in a language I don't understand if I kind of write it down or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, a big part of social media is things that are actually really hard to reproduce, like images. 
by hand. And so I wonder if that's part of the where the content bias comes in in social media. I mean, so much misinformation is actually embedded in images and it's not just text or a link to a news story. Yeah. And that that they are, I mean, both that what you're saying is very true that I don't I don't have to reproduce this whole image myself. Um, but also that the detailed characteristics and appeal of this image may be playing a huge role in its propagation. Do you, I wonder if you've thought of trying this with images or something? Yeah, like that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a good point, it, it, which unfortunately makes things even more complicated. I mean, what, what I was doing here, what my point was to have exactly the same material. So I, 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 the, the same story that I was using in the transmission chain, I was showing to the people in a kind of fake uh, social mm -hmm. networking, as so you share it, comparing image from social media and story in transmission chain would again complicate the thing because then, then you don't know if it's the social media or is the feature of the image of the mm -hmm. image. So it could be also that cultural transmission on image is uh, is different. It's it's. Uh, it, it's something I, I don't know, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Yeah, but I guess it's, if you do both, then you can disentangle this effect to some extent, right? Yeah, but how, how can I do the image bit in the transmission? You describe the, have to describe it, right? Yeah. Yeah, or I, I guess I was just imagining maybe it's a, it's different content, but perhaps it gets you back to the same level of content bias mm. in social media. Yeah, that yeah, increase in, in yeah. this richness or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, cultural transmission of image. Uh, I don't even know how to how to start to think about it, but but uh, it, uh, I, it it opens a lot of other other big problems. But, but you're right. I mean, there are so many different things in social media that that uh, uh, this is a problem. My my main point here would be to say when when people say yeah. Uh, uh, negativity spread in social media. It's 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 a problem. I mean, it, it's it's uh, why is the case? Uh, is because of particular features or is a more general thing? We don't know. There are many many layers that. that, that... And and maybe part of it here is also trying to get at something that's in between oral communication and social media, because obviously it could be that social media has a bunch of features that other media do not have. Right, but yeah. obviously a bunch of this kind of stuff was diffusing through other sorts. Yeah, of I, I mean, I think yeah, to I me, know. like so, so th there are some some um, transmission chain experiment in which they, uh, you know, you, you can you can just uh, avoid one part. Maybe you don't have to memorize. You can just uh, so I think ideally why should have like a, a lot of different conditions in which you control the various aspects of cultural transmission or, or zooming in in the process of transmission and then you can see if it makes a difference that's that's a years and years of work but that, that would be very cool it's something that I, i'm willing to do it's, it's, Okay, and uh, yeah, this is the, the, the sorry the last uh, the, the, the the usual summary slide at the end. So spread of misinformation, I would say, is limited. Some success of misinformation again. When, when I say misinformation, I'm talking about this weird weird kind of uh, content, uh, and I think some success can be explained by the possibility of exploiting cognitive preferences exactly because of less constrained with reality. I'm really not claiming that this is the main reason. I don't know, I, I don't think actually. So that there may be many reasons, but I think that this is one of the reasons. And then I think that there is this uh, interesting uh, future work between which try to understand the, the specific feature of cultural transmission and how they influence this, uh, this, uh, this content, for example, or other aspect, which is, again, not, not much, much done. Okay, and uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I probably throw to you many value stuff, and I will throw another one, and, and uh, but I will try to be quick, uh, because this, this, uh, this, uh, this is a work in progress, it's some more ideas, that's something that I would like to do in, in the future. Uh, 
cumulative cultural light. So what is cumulative culture is another of these central concept in cultural evolution. Uh, the definition is, there is an intuitive definition, which is good, which I think the, the intuitive definition is that some cultural traits increase uh, in complexity and efficiency through, uh, through time. And this increase is due to the fact that new innovation are retained through the process of transmission from one step to another. Uh, another uh, Max Planck person, but more, I don't know where he started, Leipzig, Thomas L. was calling it uh, the ratchet effect. So it's, it's something that characterizes human culture, that new innovation remains. And this creates cumulative culture. Um, but uh, one thing is that uh, cumulative culture doesn't seem to be an automatic process of cultural evolution. So it, in some cultural domains, we observe cumulative culture. Usually, the example from cultural evolutionists are uh, technology, science, but in some other domains, it's debated. Uh, in art, some claim that there is cumulative culture, that innovation are retained and maintained. Others say, no, it's not true. And I'm adding stuff, religion, uh, it's, it's, is, is Scientology an evolution of uh, early, I don't know, Roman paganism, chess? Chess actually, it's interesting, but I will not talk about this now because, because there are actually, I, I, I thought that chess were many the same for, but there are so many variants of chess. But anyway, um, the, the, the main the, the, I, I don't have to talk about chess. Uh, why, why, why this is the case? I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. And one idea is that uh, there are some features that uh, make some uh, domain that support the cultural accumulation in some domain and less in other domain. One of these features could be availability. Availability simply means that uh, uh, the more models you have to copy from, the more is likely that an innovation will be retained. There is a, a well-known model from Joe Henrik. Uh, so he, he claimed that uh, in, in, there was, a, um, there is apparently a, a decrease in the, in the uh, record of, uh, a decrease in complexity in the record of archeological, uh, in the archeological record of Tasmania. And Henrik uh, did a model in which he explained this, uh, this decrease with the fact that uh, uh, Tasmania got separated from mainland uh, Australia, so the uh, cultural population size was lower, it was uh, smaller, and this uh, could explain this uh, decrease. We don't have, again, to, to buy the, the full model, but the idea that the more, uh, the bigger the cultural population size, the more likely will be the uh, preservation of innovation seems that there are things a bit more complicated, but the, the idea in general, I think, makes sense. And I think it's also um, uncontroversial that um, online and digital media provide what they call hyper availability. So we have uh, enormous uh, cultural population size. From one side, you see this in big collaborative projects like Wikipedia or uh, Stack Overflow. Um, and also on the other side, you can see in the maintenance of very uh, niche knowledge. I happen to be a bad accordionist and I happen to have a German accordion. Uh, and I, I can find a lot of information about digital language probably uh, would have been impossible 30 years ago. This seems quite silly, but is an example of, a, of a, a niche knowledge that is maintained thank you to bigger population size, which is exactly this point. And uh, another feature that uh, make uh, cumulative cultural evolution possible is fidelity. So uh, cultural transmission is not by itself faithful. I, I was talking before about the, the telephone game. Um, so the, the information case, you know, this is an example of one of the historical uh, transmission chain. Uh, so you see, in this case, is a drawing that changed through the, through the uh, step of the transmission chain. Now, if 
capital transmission is not faithful, uh, new is less likely that new innovation will be retained, and so accumulation will not work. And again, I think that the uh, point of online digital media is that they increase fidelity. From one side, they make easy and extremely cheap, uh, virtually uh, completely faithful replication when you share something. And I think this is uh, still quite amazing for me. It's, 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 it, it didn't exist until a few years ago. And on the other side, there are things like, like uh, it's very easy to put video, it's very, uh, there are comment sections, there are, uh, uh, there are the, 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 the chats, uh, there are people that add their own video uh, below other video. And I, I think these are especially like the fidelity amplifiers. These are very useful for, for uh, um, tacit knowledge, things that you cannot express verbally. And I think these are also very important. So now the question is, uh, and it is an empirical question, is, is it possible that the, the diffusion of digital and online media boosts cumulative culture, especially for domains in which was not uh, much present before? Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in this, uh, this, this is more reflect my interest than anything else, but the, the, the last uh, plot on the, on the right is uh, um, about, it is the only work that we did, is a very preliminary work about fan fiction, because as I was saying before, there is quite a debate about the art and accumulation, and uh, fan fiction is an example in which uh, you have uh, a lot of people uh, reading and writing, it's all online, and could be, could be a good case study to see if there is accumulation in fan fiction. And I, I will conclude by, by talking very quickly about this. This is really a preliminary work. We, we try to study um, Harry Potter fan fiction uh, because it's, it's very, very diffuse. Like uh, um, in the last year, you have like more than 30,000 stories for each, uh, for each year. And, uh, and you have a lot of, you have all the text, you have the comments, you have a lot of things. And um, also, uh, I, I, I admit I, I don't know anything, no, not, not only about, I, I, I never read the report. It's, uh, my, my wife tried to have me watching the movies, but I don't like them. It's, it's a fact. I, I'm too old. And um, so in this fan fiction, it, I, I, I discovered that the, the uh, longest story and the, Two million and three hundred thousand words, which I didn't really know what meant. But this is the uh, list of the longer novels in Wikipedia, which made this fan fiction thing like the, the fourth longest novel ever written by humans in the in the in the, in the so, so like you know, this is. Which is no for being like uh, not, not exactly a light uh, reading. It's kind of half of the words of the self fiction thing. But uh, it's a funny thing. But, but just to say that so people are actually spending energy in this uh, in this endeavor. Anyway, besides this, 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 this funny bit. So we, we are trying to to see if uh, we can find in this. Uh, uh, in this data, some way to, to, to detect emulation, which is not so far very uh, easy or successful. So, so far we are working on uh, metadata, so not, not, not on the actual text. And so, for example, we found that the, the number of tags per story increase in time, which could suggest an increase in complexity of stories, but also an increase in complexity of the uh, tag system, which could be interesting, but a bit less. Uh, we found some uh, uh, weak evidence of the fact that, uh, again, only using using uh, metadata in this case, likes that uh, controlling for various things that, uh, for example, for the time of publication. But we, we found that um, more recent stories tend to be like more uh, than than uh, older story possibly suggesting that there is some form of improvement. So increasing complexity, increase of improvement, this would be the uh, feature of, of accumulation. But as I was saying, this is really 
uh, work in progress. So I, I would like to, to work more on this kind of data and see if uh, actually the fact that uh, things like, uh, like, like recipes or stories went uh, online and in social media create some uh, increase in, in their complexity, in their, in their, um, in their performance, if it can be quantified in, in some way. I think I am, yeah. Um, how should we think about, I guess, maybe the, the, the universe of what the, this is considered? I mean, here you're looking at these Harry Potter stories, and I guess one of the ideas would be that part of the reason that maybe the newer ones could be better is because more people have been attracted to this. And instead of writing whatever other fan fiction, they're writing Harry Potter fan fiction. And so, I mean, in the context of like this, the Tanzania example, Right, you look at this archaeological record that includes a bunch of things that were forgotten about. And so, should in this kind of analysis, do we need to track down all the like forgotten fan fiction forums that never took off? Right, like this might precisely succeed because there were actually earlier good examples or that the, the thought broader franchise were being popular or, yeah. Maybe, I, I don't know, you, you will need like a, probably a bit longer temporal perspective and having, and having, and, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the study of uh, unsuccessful fan fiction would be very interesting to see why they were unsuccessful and uh, we will be talk a bit about it. Um, but, but yes, I think, uh, it would, I mean, it's, it's a kind of trade-off, so, so we have a lot of data, but with a kind of short temporal uh, frame. I, 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 I think it's not a problem by itself, by itself but we need to, to be clear what kind of question. And as, as I was saying, I, I'm not, I, I really, I'm using this uh, research as uh, uh, pointing about what, what I would like to do, and, uh, and I'm also because the problem of uh, Human other problems. That's a perfect front. The, the, the concept of uh, cumulative culture is a bit problematic. So it's, it's not clear what are exactly how you define, how you define it, especially if, like in art. Like another problem is we have a clear uh, optimizing, uh, that there is an art and optimization process or not at all, but in technology is kind of clear. In that, some say yes, some say no, it's, it's an open problem. Uh, yeah, so, so there are a, quite a few questions. I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting question, so please, um, yeah, I hope to. Yeah, uh, I, I have a question about the information theory methods to quantify the complexity. You, you know, yeah, just use entropy or something like this to, yeah. to, to see if uh, there is some sort of increase. Yeah, the, in the we, we, we are actually thinking so, so uh, we, we are starting now to work on the text, and uh, we want to use uh, yeah, things more in the information theory for the complexity. The, and the main thing that we are trying to do, but uh, but uh, it's very problematic, is this uh, ratcheting idea, so trying to track. Uh, innovation in the text and if they are uh, yeah. copied by future uh, stories and all you're familiar that. with the work of uh, Simon Lidale? So yes. Yes. yes yes yeah because he had something yes could, yes like yes. you could yes. use tail divergence to check if there's some sort of innovation so it's like a proxy point, yeah right? yeah 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 we, we, are, we are looking exactly okay. this kind of thing but yeah i think it would also be nice with what we said this morning about the pasco paper where maybe it's in i think in art maybe it's disparity which is accumulating, so it's it's getting more and more and different sort of traits. It could also be like that, that, so the divergence would increase, right? Or you get more and more different stuff instead of optimizing or making it more efficient or yeah. better in that sense. And I, I don't know. I I, I tend to agree, but I, I think is is an open question. There are there are some for me quite convincing analysis, for example, of uh, like all of this kind mm -hmm. of thing about the. Uh, um, well, the, the, the movie thing, I don't like it too much, but the, <laughs> the, actually, I don't know if it's Moretti or Rolling, but the, the, the horror kind of thing. What? No, the, not the horror, the, what, what is called, the, the, 
what do you call it in English? Edgar Allan Poe and these people, it's noir, no, I, I don't know, it's, it's a bit gothic, no, whatever. Mm -hmm. so, so like that, it's, it's, there is some nice analysis in which they show that like uh, particular tricks were kind of invented, like the, the, the house in the countryside, the, the closed room when there, is a, when there is a thing. So someone invented it for the first time and then people started to use. This, this seems to me like a good case of cumulative culture. So you have an innovation, this, inno this innovation is successful and people will use and the story it's difficult to say it becomes better. I, I don't know. It, it's not clear to say, but I, I can imagine that even in art, that would that would be some form of process in which things get more more. Uh, yeah, but but yeah, I, I think it is a complicated uh, question. Okay, so I think we're we're at the end of the talk. Yes, I I, so, uh, I think you're ready. Maybe. Thank you.